Hi everybody. Here's just a quick video to show you how to do the various problems that were on the, fine, on the uh, midterm exam. So in the first problem we have a snowboarder that starts at height h1, slides down a frictionless um, slope, crashes into person b here and has an inelastic collision and they stick together and then they go up to some new height h2. So the way you do this is with conservation of energy where you have ma mass a times g times h1 and that becomes one half ma v let's call this v1 squared so point one is here so they start at rest with all of their energy is potential and that becomes kinetic. So at point one, they have speed V1. Immediately after the collision, just so V1 is right before they hit the guy, V2 is right after they hit the guy, uh, mass B. At, during the collision, we have conservation of momentum. So that means that MA times V1 is equal to the sum of the two masses because we have conservation of momentum the sum of the two masses times V2. Okay, so after the collision, you have conservation of momentum, you have a new speed, V2. Now, in this, the last part, where you're going up to this height here, now you have conservation of energy again, where the kinetic energy with this new velocity here is going to turn into the potential energy at the very final uh, point here. So what you have is one half times the sum of the two masses, ma plus mb, and that is going to be times v2 squared, v2 being the sum or, or the uh, velocity after the collision, and then that equals the sum of the two masses, ma plus mb times g times h2, and you solve for h2, and you can see that these masses actually cancel out here. So that's the first problem. And the next problem is what looks like a projectile motion problem, but because it doesn't ask you to calculate the final angle, it doesn't ask you to calculate the time, it doesn't ask you to calculate some of these other things, so you can actually do this with conservation of energy really simply. And so the skier flies off the jump at an initial speed of 22 meters per second and an angle of 32 degrees. Now, you could break this into x and y components like we always do, but there's actually an easier way to do this because all you're trying to find is the speed at the moment when he strikes the ground. The speed means you don't care about the angle and you don't care about how much time this took. So what we have is Here's the initial height. Um, here, this is 27 meters. So what you have is potential energy plus the initial kinetic energy when he flies off the ramp equals, so he flies through the air, lands on the ground, where your potential energy, mgh, where h is equal to zero. So you just have the initial and that's going to equal one half mv final squared. It really is that easy. Um, if you were going to try to do it the other way using projectile motion, you would need to break it into components and then use this equation where v y squared equals v naught y squared plus two a y y minus y naught. And then if you did that, what you actually did was to find the y component, it should come out to be negative, and then vx is the one that doesn't change, it's just going to be 22 times the cosine of 32. Your final speed is the magnitude of that vector. Let me draw that a little bit better. So that's the, the vector that you would be looking for. So this is vx and this is vy. Okay, don't confuse it with v naught y. Okay. All right, this one, the puck is moving along a frictionless 
air hockey table, so this is horizontal with the ground. And in this problem, um, many people were surprised that they didn't get any points at all. And let me tell you why that may have happened. Um, momentum is a vector, and it is a conserved quantity, which means the mass of the puck bef um, before the collision times its velocity, and notice velocity is a vector, plus the mass of the arrow times the velocity of the arrow is going to equal the sum of those two masses, the mass of the arrow plus the mass of the puck times that final velocity. So they run into each other here and the final momentum and velocity vector looks like that. And so because these are at right angles to each other, you might have noticed that just the MV of the puck initially and the MV of the arrow initially, if you just do Pythagorean theorem on it, you actually that was a shortcut to the answer. Just be careful though because for many people I said okay let's do a slightly different problem and have the puck moving like this and people couldn't do it when they're at right angles to each other. But oops that should have a arrow above it. Um, what a lot of people did was just to plug in the velocity of the puck here, the velocity of the arrow here, and just solved it algebraically. But this is a vector which means you have to break it into components. So um, you have to break the this equation, this full equation, into the x and y components. It turns out that the x component of this is zero and the y component of this is zero and then it's just a couple of easy steps from there. But make sure that you know how to do these problems when these are not just at right angles to each other. This problem was kind of easy in that respect. And finally we have a problem that again brings conservation of energy into play. We've got a block that gets compressed against the spring so it starts out um, here and gets compressed by some amount to 0.220 meters and that is the gives us the amount of kinetic of potential energy that's initially stored in the spring. This has friction the whole way along here. Okay, So what happens is that some of that potential energy that's stored in the spring, so that's your one-half kx squared, some of that energy is going to be lost as heat as this thing passes along the friction, uh, the friction surface here. And the amount of work that's done by friction is going to be um, equal to the friction force dot with dis the displacement. What that means is that your friction force is mu times n, the normal force, n in this case is just mg because it's on a horizontal surface, and the distance s is going to be 0.5 meters, and of course then we have a cosine of 180 degrees because the force, the friction force, points in the opposite direction of the displacement vector. So you just go ahead and find this. It comes out to be a negative quantity. So the The first part of the problem is just to find the work done by friction as the box moves to the right. Um, the second part of the problem is, so for this one we would just do work done by friction is F dot S which is equal to mu m g s times the cosine of 180. Here S is equal to 0.5 meters because friction is all along the horizontal surface and then your mass is given and you know what G is and the coefficient of friction is 0.4 that's your mu right there. Okay that's the first part. The speed of the box at the bottom of the ramp is going to be determined by one-half kx squared where k is the spring constant which is given, x is the amount that it's compressed which is 0.22 meters. That squared minus the work done by friction equals one-half mv squared and that's the speed 
of the box oops, when it's at the bottom of the ramp. The, la the second to last part, the vertical distance h that the box reaches before sliding back down, what we have to think about is the energy that it has here is all kinetic energy, and that energy is converted into potential energy as it goes up the ramp. So what we're going to do in this case is to take the speed of the box when it's at the bottom of the ramp, take that and put it into 1 half mv squared, that becomes mgh, so just solve for h there. And the m's cancel out, makes it pretty easy. All right, the last part is after the box slides back down the ramp, um, is it moving fast enough to compress the spring again? And so because there's no friction here, there's no energy lost, so whatever energy you had here before you went up is also the same amount of energy that you have here when you come back down. What you can do is just find the work done by friction that you got in part A and see if you lose that amount of friction. And it turns out, or that amount of work done by friction. So it turns out that the work done by friction as you go from here to here is less than the amount of kinetic energy this has when it gets back to the bottom of the ramp. So the answer to the last part is yes, indeed, it is moving fast enough to compress the spring again. And you can support your answer just by comparing your answer for part A to the total amount of energy that the box has at the bottom of the ramp. So if this is bigger than this, then there's energy left over to compress the spring again.